in our most intimate conversations, you will hear the Lola say, Sa'awa nong Jos, like a chorus to a song, or the last prayer on a string of beads, Sa'awa nong Jos. After 50 years, the women have come forward. One by one, they hear the story of Lola Rosa Hansen on the radio, a woman like themselves, shamed into silence, but not anymore. Is there anybody else she wants to know? Are there others? And one at a time, the women take a jeepney to Lola's house. They ask their grandchildren to bring them. They, take a, they ride a motor tricycle with their grown daughters. A former beauty, I'm sorry. A former beauty queen greets them, helps them organize, tells them to fight. For the first time, the grannies will sit together and see women who have had to endure the same secret for 50 years. They will speak their stories. They will stand on streets and protest. They will seek justice. How do you manage it, you ask? How? You say, and they look at you and smile. Sa'awa nang Jos, they whisper, through the mercy of God. It doesn't matter if she is Catholic or Muslim, or if God has not seen the walls of her kitchen. She will at some point tell you, I have made it through the mercy of God. Sa'awa nang Jos. Testimony of Lucia Alvarez. Lola's House, Quezon City, July 1999. Thank you. I owe Richie. She paid for my haircut. Should I start? Are you ready? <coughs> I am Lucia Alvarez. Do you want to know where I was born? I was born on the island of Samar. And my birth date? February 12, 1925. So, my story. Like this, Ganito. <laughs> in 1941, when I was 16 years old, I fell in love and I married into a family who loved me. By the following year, I had given birth to a baby. Because they thought I was beautiful and because they loved me, my in-laws pampered me. We lived with them so I could stay home with the baby. <clears throat> After the war began, our family moved to an evacuation center in the mountains. In October of 1944, I heard my mother-in-law screaming one day. I ran to her and saw my husband being beaten by Japanese soldiers. They punched him. They boxed his ears. They poked his chest and with the bayonet swords. Blood ran down his chest and covered his clothing. I could see how badly they wanted to kill him. Let's go to the mayor, my mother-in-law said. Let's get him to help. He is the mayor, isn't he? So I snuck out the door, and before I could run, the Japanese, who were beating my husband, saw me. They dropped my husband and left, me, and left him for dead and began to carry me away. I resisted, even though they pulled me with both arms. They had to drag my body because I would not go. Tapos, I lost my balance. I fell and hit a large stone and broke the joint here. She stretches her left arm and points to the inside of her elbow. I cried out, and instead of helping me up, they pushed me. They were irritated that I fell. They pulled me. When they saw that my arm was broken, they tied my limb up in a sling. They shouted to me in words I could not understand. I wiped the tears from my eyes with my right hand and saw blood. I cried, and I cried the entire walk. I could not stop. I cried even as I climbed the hill to the seminary doors of St. Vincent de Paul in Calayo. The soldiers threw me in a room. They stripped me of my clothes and left me naked for a week. Yes, naked. So it was easier for them when they raped me. Each time soldiers felt the urge, they simply barged into the room, two soldiers at a time. And holding a gun nearby, they used me. My body was so dirty, my arms so swollen with infection, I could not bear the severe pain. I would scream every time they came near me because the pain was so great. 
And also, I lost the movement in my right hand. It was so swollen. Look, the Japanese told me, if you don't like what we're doing, we'll kill you. After one week, they gave me back my clothing. But for a month, I suffered the same abuse. My infected arm was left in that sling. The pain was so unbearable. I only re remember the constant stream of tears falling. They raped me constantly. I couldn't bear the pain of this. She indicates the broken arm, the bruised palm of her right hand. The two, two Japanese soldiers and three Filipino soldiers besides stood watch over me, and every time the Japanese entered the room, the Filipinos left me there, all alone. After a month, I noticed a silence. Where were the soldiers? The only ones who entered the room were the Visayan soldiers. The raping had finally ended, and soon not even the Visayan soldiers were coming into the room. I snuck out the door. I peeked around the corner, looking. Nothing. No people. I found my way to the seashore and looked for soldiers. No one. I looked across the water and saw my parents' body. My parents welcomed me home and treated my arms and my hands. They gave me medicine and they brought healers to fix my bones and, they dis and my disjointed elbow. In some ways, it was too late. The pain had become a permanent part of my body. If you don't take care of these things right away, they stay with you forever. When my husband heard I was alive, he came to me. A month had already gone by. I saw a weak man, sickly with wounds of the war. But I loved him, and I went with him. You know, my in-laws thought I was dead. So when they saw me, they were so happy. Because my husband was weak, he could not work. And so our parents took us both in. You know, they loved me very much. I was younger then, and I was rounder and prettier. I had a look. <laughs>